We're going to continue with our discussion of uh, Ozark's traditions and, and customs. And uh, before we do that, we're going to take another look at a trio of famous Ozarkers. And now, unlike uh, Junior Cobb, our last famous Ozarker, these people were actually nationally famous at one point, legitimately nationally famous at one point. If you were of a certain age, you would remember these folks and recognize them. As you can see, that's a pretty old picture, so we're not of that certain age. But if you had been around in the 1920s and 30s, you certainly would have recognized these people. And we're talking about the three people on the right, not the one in the ticket booth or the other whatever is going on with that person. And so what do you... Who do you think these are? Well, you got the same. You got the era right. The Will Rogers, 1920s and 30s. The, the, actually, the the answer is is up there. The Weaver Brothers and Elvira. You see the little <laughs> the board over on the left. Uh, the they the Weaver Brothers and Elvira. Uh, that was the that was their act. That was their their stage name, basically. Uh, they are, uh, this is uh, June Weaver, who went by Elviry on stage. Uh, that's Leon Weaver, who was Abner on stage. And then that's Frank Weaver, who was Cicero. That was his stage name. And they were a vaudeville group. They, were actually, they actually had a, a whole cast of, of actors and musicians that they traveled the country with. At one time, their show was, uh, their troupe was known as the Arkansas Travelers, uh, but they were usually billed as the Weaver Brothers and Elviry, and then they had a bunch of other uh, acts with them. But in the 1920s and 30s, they traveled around the country on the, on the vaudeville circuit and, and putting on shows. Uh, they even uh, went over to Europe and did several shows uh, in different European countries and were one of the most famous acts of their day uh, and then in the 1930s, they uh, got into movies, and uh, they ended up filming probably about a dozen movies uh, after a while, and it may say on the next screen up here, uh, no, just a series of Depression-era films, but in the, in the late 1930s and early 40s, they did a number of movies. These were uh, the old B movies of the days. They're... Uh, I think they filmed most of their movies with Republic Studio. And uh, these were movies that were often shown before the main feature, the feature film. But they were very popular movies, especially amongst rural audiences and small town audiences around the country uh, because they had to do with kind of working class themes and, and things like that. Uh, but the Weaver brothers were from Christian County, just to our south. Elviry was not, but she had married into the family. And when I say married into the family, she was at, at one time married to Leon and at one time married to Frank. She really liked the Weaver brothers. And uh, that was, uh, but they, even through divorces and marrying brothers and all that kind of stuff, the, the group stayed together as an act and uh, were very, very popular in the 1920s and 30s. And this, uh, more than likely, this picture dates from their pre-movie days when they were still on the, on the uh, traveling circuit and, and giving shows, live shows, around the country. So that's, that's their story. I bet somebody had heard of the Weaver Brothers. Or maybe not. All right. There, uh, you can, you can, I've got uh, two or three of their movies. Uh, I think they're pirated DVDs. They, say, they look like it. And uh, I didn't do it, but, uh, you know, you, you buy stuff on eBay and you never know what you're going to get, you know. And, uh, but uh, every once in a while, you can catch a Weaver Brothers movie on like an old, uh, on uh, Turner Classic Movies or something like that. And they're all black and white. And 
they were musicians, so the movies and their act had a lot of music in it. And what they were known for, uh, especially uh, Leon Weaver, was uh, playing homemade instruments. Like he would play a saw and just different, just kind of silly stuff. And uh, so, that, the Weaver brothers. And what's our, our phrase or our words for the, day, for the day? Light a shuck. Now I bet somebody knows what light a shuck means. We've all lit a shuck at one time or another, even if you didn't know if you were doing it. Somebody knows what a lot of shuck. If I'm going to lie to shuck, what does it mean? And it means to get out of here in a hurry, to depart in haste. If you lie to shuck, you hit the road in a hurry and take off. Yeah, that's what that means, to lie to shuck. Okay, somebody knows what a thunder mug is. Yeah, a slop jar or a chamber pot. So, yeah, if you, if you drop that in the kitchen, yeah, it would, be, it would be a good time to light a shuck. Yeah, yeah. Well, you had to carry it out. You had to go through the kitchen to, to get out the back door. No, no. It, no, that's... A, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the slop jar, that was for like nighttime, so you didn't have to go outside, you know, to relieve yourself. Yeah. Like a bad pan. <laughs> all right. So, more edification. We're just learning all kinds of stuff. All right. Okay, I think that's uh, we left off on courtship and marriage last time. I did find uh, my paper that I meant to bring to our last session when we when we started our discussion of of traditions and customs, and just a couple things uh, that I had on my thing. One of them was uh, going back to our agriculture, our our uh, garden wisdom: uh, never plant in the new moon or on on the day after the new moon. So that's. That's one you can keep in mind. Uh, plant in uh, when the uh, during the so-called fruitful signs, uh, and the fruitful signs, according to at least this one source, are the signs in the chest, uh, the secrets, and the feet. So, I don't remember what those signs correspond with, but uh, so that's another one. Uh, now here's here's one that. Uh, that doesn't have to do with the signs, but it's a, it was an old tradition that I found in a book. Uh, when women are menstruating, and some of these have, have to do with practically everything, uh, it was often in the Ozarks called uh, the granny visit, or when granny visits. Has anybody ever heard that? Or when the old lady visits. You've heard that one? Okay, that's, uh, that's an old phrase, probably not much in use anymore, but when the old lady or when granny visits, uh, women were not supposed to wash their hair, not really sure why, uh, you weren't supposed to pickle cucumbers, because the cucumbers would, be, would, ter, would turn out, uh, or the pickles would turn out flabby, yeah, flabby, I, I really don't, or, and you weren't supposed to make sauerkraut. Uh, all of these sound reasonable to me. I don't really. Uh, but uh, those are three things you weren't supposed to do when Granny visited. Uh, to ward off seed ticks, and we could all use a little of that if you spend much time out in the woods in the summertime in the Ozarks. To ward off seed tick, you can use uh, penny royal, which is another, uh, another weed or a, a, a wild plant uh, that you can find. And here's, a, here's one of those poultices. Uh, for a really bad cold, uh, treat it with a poultice made of lard, camphor, turpentine, and fried onions. So that really sounds appealing, doesn't it? Think of all the things that really just reek 
and are, are disgusting and, and smush them together and, and use that. Uh, for ringworm, now this could come in handy, and, uh, and supposedly this actually uh, can work. Uh, for ringworm, you're supposed to squeeze uh, green walnut juice on the spot. Have you ever heard that one? And uh, that's, I, I think that could actually, you know, could actually work. So green walnut juice for ringworm. For a newborn baby's umbilical cord to get it to heal up or whatever they do, uh, you cover it with flannel that has been burnt by an iron. You know, sometimes you just wonder where did they, you know, who was the first person who tried that? You know, they accidentally burn a piece of flannel and, you know, stuck it on the baby and it seemed to heal up. So that, uh, but, and here's uh, for hives, for, for hives and, and babies, uh, a tea made of sheep or goat pills. Does anybody know what sheep or goat pills are? Droppings. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, lucky baby there. You know, you. Hey, Makes you not want to get hives, doesn't it? And the last one is uh, for, uh, this is a homemade recipe for cough syrup. Uh, you mix uh, ground up cherry tree bark with Mona leaves. And I don't have any idea what Mona leaves are. I don't know if that's kind of a tree or a bush or exactly what that, but uh, uh, cherry tree bark, Mona leaves, you boil that, then you mix it with honey and alcohol and that's the, that's the most important ingredient in any kind of cough medicine anyway is alcohol, right? You know, you can put anything in there with uh, like NyQuil and all that kind of stuff. It's about 10% alcohol and it knocks you out and, you know, you go about your business. So that's uh, some of the other ones in here. Now we've, we've got, uh, as you can see here, we talked about uh, one kind of aphrodisiac uh, last time and we've got different potions for attracting or catching a member of the opposite sex. And all of these apparently were used at one time or another by someone. Uh, all of these come from Vance Randolph's Ozark Magic and Folklore. Uh, some of these just sound really strange. Uh, pinning a small wasp nest to your underwear. You know, that was... Uh, I'm assuming, you know, we're talking about a paper wasp nest and not like a dirt dauber nest. That'd be harder to, to keep from crumbling. You know, you'd have a mess in your underwear at some point there. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, Millie's turkey beard concealed in clothing. Uh, soaking fingernail trimmings in whiskey. Now, what you would do is you would soak them in there and then take them out before the whiskey was actually consumed and you would want the person that you were sweet on to drink the whiskey and and for them to be your fingernails so you know keep that in mind you want to do it right if you're, so if you're no you would you would i think you would want to take them out yeah that would i hope so yeah yeah you know if, if you're if you're drunk enough you're not going to notice Drinking a few fingernails, but, uh, you know, clippings anyway. But uh, you, I think it would be better to take them out. And uh, tying a piece of cloth in a red bud or hawthorn tree. I'm going to do that because I have a red bud tree and all. I didn't know if it worked. Okay. <laughs> all right. And I don't know if, uh, again, I, I'm guessing that the, the cloth or the tree sort of knows who your sweetheart is, you know, or, or I don't, there may be some other part that I didn't put in there for that one. Because it seems kind of random, you know. It sounds like you're hedging your bets. If I don't catch a man, it's not. Your well, I am. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to be blamed for this. But uh, but it, it may work just because, or maybe you know, say their name or something when you when you. Maybe it's it. just any man. It could be it. Maybe if you're if you're just really you're not really picky. <laughs> it's just time to find a, a man. Then you know, just try it, and somebody will wonder if. Uh, for attracting a woman, there, are, there apparently are fewer options for attracting a woman. Maybe, maybe it's because men aren't as superstitious or they just don't really care 
as much, or they're not going to do them, or they just wouldn't admit it, you know, if they did silly stuff. Uh, like the powdered wild gander's foot in coffee. This is uh, cut off a goose's foot, grind it up, and then put it in, in the coffee of your, of your sweetheart or the, the woman that you want to be your sweetheart. Sounds reasonable enough to me, right? Uh, that it sounds better than the dried tongue of a turtle dove hidden in a woman's cabin. You know, I, that, you've got to go through a lot of trouble, you know, to, to do that. The dried tongue of a... And I'm not sure where you would hide it. And you would have to break, be breaking and entering, you know, to, to get it into her family's cabin. But uh, the, probably the best thing is just not to overanalyze these things, you know, because they kind of, you know, fall apart when you start thinking about them a lot. Uh, but again, we go back to our signs. And I guess for obvious reasons, you, uh, it's preferred that you marry when the sign is in the privates or in the secrets. Uh, or you can see on the, on the full moon in June, whenever that happens to be. We've already talked about uh, the end fair uh, and chivalry and stuff like that. And some of these other traditions or superstitions, uh, the first newlywed to fall to sleep on, their, on the wedding night will be the first to die. If I had known that, I would have paid attention, but I don't remember. You know, it's been way too many years by now. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was my wife because, you know, she beats me to sleep by three hours every night anyway. So I don't, I don't know what. But, uh, uh, and this is, uh, this is another kind of strange when A bride who cooks her own wedding dinner uh, will, will soon die. So... That sounds like, to me, something that was made up to get a woman out of cooking her wedding dinner. Honey, you know what happens if I cook? You know, it's, uh, yeah, that's, and that's just it. You know, you've got your, your feast that you have at the, at the bride's house. Uh, it, the tradition, as we talked about uh, earlier, the, the feast at the bride's house on the day of the wedding. And so you're, you know, you're not going to be cooking your dinner normally, you know. Unless you just you know, unless you don't have any family, that kind of thing. So, you know, way back when the women had babies right and left, and they often died young. And oh, sure. Birth, so, yeah. You know. So, you know. Yeah. Well, it was. Uh, yeah. The, uh, in the early days uh, of the Ozarks, and, and well beyond that, uh, it was it was pretty common for men to outlive their their wives. And sometimes more than one wife, uh, because of the the danger in childbirth before we had modern medical techniques, and especially if you lived out in the rural Ozarks somewhere and you didn't have access to a to a doctor or a trained doctor, and uh, so there were any number of things that could kill you in those days, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people didn't make it. All right, just a couple of. Uh, practices that some people in the Ozarks would have considered uh, witchcraft or anti-witchcraft in one case, or at least kind of messing around with, you know, uh, witch, witchcraft, devilish sorts of powers. And uh, these are things that, uh, that a lot of people in the Ozarks would not have done, but there were examples of them into the early 20th century uh, one of them was called the egg tree, which was uh, an old tradition. I'm not sure where this goes back to, what you know, country this comes from or anything, or even if we know. Uh, but the egg tree, uh, Vance Randolph found a, a few rare examples of egg trees in uh, southwest Missouri in the early 1900s and heard old timers talking about remembering uh, more when there were more of these egg trees. And these were usually uh, dead bushes that were stuck in the ground, uh, often uh, underneath a cedar tree, and, uh, and eggshells were placed on the limbs of the bushes, and these were supposed to ward off witches. So that's 
Uh, an interesting variation of this, and I was just reading this uh, last week in a, in a book, a woman who had been born in the late 1800s and had grown up in the Ozarks, remembered back to her childhood when her mother in the summertime would bring in a, would cut a cedar tree, bring it in the house, would put it in the fireplace, in the, in the chimney there, and would hang eggshells egg on the cedar tree. And the woman who remembers this remembered it as being a decoration, like a, you know, you would, instead of just having a big open fireplace that you're not using, uh, the chimney you're not using in the summertime because it's warm, her idea was that her mother just put it there for, to, you know, to decorate the house. But I wonder, you know, if her mother may have had other reasons for having that tree, except she didn't use a, a dead bush. It was a dead cedar tree, in this case, that they, they put in the chimney. But it's, a, it's an interesting sort of variation of the, the egg tree that Vance Randolph described. And this would have been, uh, you know, around 1900 or the late 1800s that the woman was remembering this, uh, this tree in their chimney. So that's kind of a, kind of a neat sort of thing. Uh, but again, uh, there's, a, there's an entire chapter in uh, Vance Randolph's book devoted to uh, the traditions and customs associated with witchcraft. He was really interested in that kind of stuff. You didn't find a lot of people in the rural Ozarks who practiced witchcraft, but there were, there were a few, and he really uh, sought them out and, and recorded a lot of traditions that they had. And there were still a lot of people who had superstition, superstitions that had to do with witches and cats and, and, and things like that. Uh, not that many people practiced witchcraft, but people knew about a lot of the, the superstitions surrounding it. Now, this is an interesting one, too. And I've read uh, accounts of dumb suppers or dummy suppers in, in several uh, different places, uh, from the, uh, even from the early 1900s in the Ozarks. And the dumb supper in the Ozarks, we'll get back to uh, the Gaelic uh, festival in a minute. Uh, the dumb supper in the Ozarks, the way it's usually described is uh, in the cases that I've read, it doesn't have to take place on a certain night or anything like that, but it always, it always happens at night. And it's sometimes called a backward supper. Because what, uh, what it was is usually a group of young women would get together, and this is always something that women did, or, or you know, unmarried, usually unmarried girls or, or young women would get together late at night, and they would make, uh, make a supper, you know, beans and cornbread or whatever the normal stuff that you would eat in the rural Ozarks, and they would do everything backwards. They would, like, stand with their backs to the stove, and they would... Uh, pour the drinks behind them. And, all, it, and that's why it was sometimes called a backwards supper. You do everything backwards. You would set the table backwards, uh, turn the chairs away from the table, all this kind of stuff. You did, did everything in reverse order of what you would normally do, and you did it kind of with your back to, you know, turned around from how you would normally do it. And you go through all this process, and the idea is that you, you get the supper done and you have it ready uh, just before midnight. And when the clock strikes midnight, you're, uh, what, the idea is that you're, you're making these, uh, you, you set the table and you put the food on the plates and all this kind of stuff. And you're making these plates for your future husband. That's why it's single girls who do this. And the idea is that you stand behind your future husband's setting and when the clock strikes midnight, uh, you'll see like a ghostly image of the man who will be your husband. And, uh, and that was, so it was kind of uh, an occult sort of thing that, uh, that women, it got, you know, the same sort of seance, sort of scare yourself, you know, that you can imagine uh, what's, what's going on. After a while in the Ozarks, sometimes it, it, it turned into... Uh, they would have these suppers, and the idea was that your future husband would actually come into the house at midnight. And sometimes they would get word around, you know, to, to Millie's sweetheart 
that she's doing a dumb supper tonight and wouldn't it be neat if you came in the house at midnight? And so the, you know, the, the guy would actually come in and you kind of lose some of the uh, occult, uh, you know, otherworldly element of it uh, a little bit like that. But that was, that was uh, the, the dumb supper. And where it probably grows out of it, and, and these dumb suppers uh, have been, uh, were chronicled as early as the 1600s in England. So they were something that, that they were brought across the ocean here. And they probably date back in a much different form to the, uh, to the Gaelic festival of Samhain, which was a, which was a Halloween night festival, a pagan sort of festival. The idea there was you would, you would uh, set the table, you would make this supper, and at midnight the recently deceased would come back, at least in spirit, uh, and sort of as a parting, you know, that, that would be kind of their last supper uh, with you, your last uh, communion with your recently deceased loved ones. And this would happen you know, on Halloween night. And, uh, and so more than likely, I, I, I think the, the Dumb Supper probably is some kind of, you know, offshoot of that uh, that just got uh, a little less morbid uh, by uh, looking toward the future instead of looking to the past and, and lamenting, you know, lost, lost loved ones and now you're, you're looking to the future of, of who you're going to marry, that sort of thing. And it's just, it becomes something just for unmarried young women. How does all of this fit with their religious beliefs? Well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, the, the same woman who was talking about that I, that I told you I was reading, and she was talking about this egg tree, her mother bringing this cedar tree into that, she mentions uh, knowing neighbors who had one of these dumb suppers, and she said that her mother uh, wouldn't let them because she considered it witchcraft. She considered it, she considered it, uh, you know, unchristian to to do this uh, silly sort of stuff, and just to like you know some people would consider like a Ouija board or, or something like that to be uh, unchristian or dabbling in witchcraft, that that sort of thing, and so uh, so it didn't it didn't mix well with a lot of religious beliefs. Some people probably did it anyway, just like. Some Christians and other religious people today will, you know, do, do things like seances and, and, and stuff like that uh, and, and consider it just kind of harmless fun or something. Uh, but but as, as I mentioned, religion is one of, the, th- one of the, the, the things that helps tear down these old traditions and customs. It's uh, as people, uh, and especially... As you go through, through the 19th century and into the 20th century, and as the Methodists and the Baptists and the, the people who kind of dominated religion in the Ozarks, which we'll talk about after the midterm, uh, became more and more kind of middle class and respectable, these kinds of practices, traditions, superstitions were considered unacceptable. These were unchristian, they were uncivilized, they were not what... <laughs> you know, good modern Christian people do. And so a lot of them were put, a, put away for that very reason. What other things do you think caused the demise of these folk customs and traditions besides religion? Technology. Science, Science uh, technology. Anything else? Education. Education, that was, that was a big one. Uh, it goes along with science and, and technology. Uh, education, probably along with religion, was the thing that as people went to school, and especially those who, uh, who made it to high school and went off to college, especially if you went off to college, you probably, and you started seeing your world through the eyes of outsiders and thinking, boy, that, that was sure backward, that was superstitious. And, and there, there would be that, uh, that tendency to distance yourself from those old traditions and customs and to leave those behind. And probably a lot of teachers, even you know, school teachers, uh, tried to 
break people of these traditions. Just like if you think about, uh, I remember when I was a kid and teachers, uh, you know, threatened us with bodily harm when we said ain't and all the, you know, all the stuff. And, and all of the, you know, the, you sort of have, you go to school and you sort of have a lot of these, uh, you have a lot of your folk language beaten out of you. I mean, maybe not literally. Uh, in some cases, when I was in school, you know, it could be beaten out of you. But, uh, but you, you know, you, you sort of learn from people that these things aren't acceptable. You know, that's not how, how educated Americans talk, that sort of thing. And before you know it, you're, you're ad adopting the practices and speech and mannerisms of respectable society. Your teachers who've been off and they've been educated, and sometimes they're from outside of the region. The same kind of thing with these these customs, regional customs and traditions, after a while, they just become something that, that educated modern people just don't do. And that's why they survive in little pockets in places uh, where people tend to be isolated or maybe amongst uh, some iconoclastic people who just hold on to them just despite you know, other people. We're going to keep doing this like we've, we've always done it. And who cares what you think? But that's how these traditions are. They're just, they're gradually eaten away by modern society. Uh, radio comes along and TV comes along and you see the wide world out there and you realize that most people uh, who are considered important by the national media, uh, by Americans, are not doing these kinds of things. So... You know, you see a, a, a gradual decline in, in all these kinds of traditions. All right. And we have some death and burial customs and traditions to end on. I guess that's fitting to end with, to end with the end, right? The... Uh, and one of the things you, you can find in Vance Randolph's Ozark Magic and Folklore, there is just page after page of omens and signs that someone's going to die. Uh, it's very, very morbid, but there were just... Uh, part of it is going back to what uh, uh, Millie and Ed and, and various of us have said earlier. Death was such a common and unpredictable thing in those days, and, and there was so little that you could actually do to, to ward it off uh, that all of these, you know, all of these things probably at one time happened. You know, someone heard a, an owl hoot outside the house, and the, the next day, uh, you know, little Billy died or something. And, and, and all of these become part of these, uh, these folk legends and, and folk traditions after a while. Uh, now, some of these, uh, like a cow bawling for no apparent reason, if you live on a farm, you're thinking somebody's dying all the time because cows are always bawling, and you never really know what they're bawling. You can sometimes tell they're bawling for their calf or, or they're scared or something like that, but sometimes they're just bawling. And that's what cows do. And so, you know, according to that, you know, every day somebody's in, in grave danger of succumbing. Uh, the whippoorwill calling atop a house. We've already visited the whippoorwill once, but you don't want a whippoorwill on top of your house. And I don't think I've ever, uh, well, I'm still here, so obviously I haven't heard a whippoorwill on top of my house, but, but uh, I don't, uh, usually whippoorwills don't sit on a house, you know. Yeah, they're usually on the, on the ground, or so. they're, they're, kind of, they're ground birds. So that's, that's what's unusual about it. I, I guess it would freak somebody out, if there was a whippoorwill on top of their house, because it almost never happens. And it probably happened once that a whippoorwill called from the top of somebody's house and somebody died. And then, well, that's what happens when you have a whippoorwill on your house. So maybe you want to... They should have some kind of potion for warding off whippoorwills that you could put on top of a house, and that way you wouldn't have to worry about it. A cat licking the front door... Uh, not really sure. I mean, that, that, could, that could happen really easy. You know, just drop some food, you know, and it smears on the front door and the cat's licking it all of a sudden. But uh, there may be some, some kind of something for that. 
a turtle dove, a bat, or a screech owl in the house is a sure sign that somebody in that house was going to die soon. Uh, you wouldn't want any of those birds in your house. And uh, most of us don't have to worry about that kind of stuff anymore. When's the last time you had a screech owl in your house? Although that would be kind of neat. You know, screech owls make very unusual noises, and uh, that would be... What's that? Their death that they're a sign of. Well, it could be. Yeah, that more than likely, if a bird got in your house, that would signal their quick death because you're probably going to kill them, you know, uh, or kill yourself trying to kill them, trying to get them out of the house. You know, I've, I've had a bird in the house before, but it hasn't been one of these kinds of birds. That's, that's the key. You know, it's been like a sparrow or a wren or something that gets in the house and, that's when you need a really fine mesh, you know, fishnet. Yeah. Get them out of there with that. It wouldn't have been uncommon though back then, would it? No, uh uh-uh. uh. Wild critters would get in. Sure. The yeah. In in a day when uh, you know, people didn't have storm windows and you might not have windows, mm-hmm. uh of of and you leave the door open, no screen doors, that that kind of stuff. Stuff would be getting in your house all the time, and that's probably the least of your worries. You know, snakes getting houses and stuff. It's, it's amazing that that's not one of the superstitions. A rattlesnake getting in your house, somebody will soon die. I guess that's just kind of understood, you know. That's, uh, I, I would rather have a bird in the wall than a skunk. That, that happened to my house once. We got a skunk in the wall. And when a skunk gets in the wall and, and gets panicked, well, you can imagine what's going to happen. And they spray... And uh, so, yeah, and then you move out of your house for, for a while. Yeah, but uh, so uh, transplanting cedars, I've never known anyone who actually dug up a cedar and tried to plant it somewhere else, and maybe this is why. Uh, or maybe it's just because there are so many of them in the Ozarks, why even bother, you know, transplanting cedars? But I'm, I'm guessing uh, if you, one of the things you can do is if you go to an old cemetery, in the rural Ozarks, there almost always be these huge cedar trees and old cemeteries. And I don't know if they just, if they just left, you know, cut everything else and left a cedar too, or if somebody actually transplanted these things. And maybe there's some, you know, the, the cedar tree as an evergreen, you know, symbol of everlasting life, that sort of thing. I think that's why you find them in cemeteries a lot. But I wonder if people transplanted those to get them in the cemetery where they just happen to be, you know, growing there because we have cedars. A lot. Uh, the loss of a baby shoe. That's, again, kind of a morbid one there. Uh, I don't know if it's the baby that will soon die or if somebody else in the family uh, dies. But, uh, uh, and some of, these, uh, some of these death customs... <coughs> Uh, we, we talked about uh, sitting up with the dead uh, previously, but there are lots of other uh, customs that are associated with, with dying uh, in the rural Ozarks. And of course, uh, we're talking about mainly in the days before embalming and the time of year you died played a lot of role in, in what, uh, what happened uh, with your body and whether or not uh, they you know, put you in the ground the very next day or, 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 you know, have to wait until the ground thaws out or, or when they do the, the funeral, that kind of stuff. We, we talked uh, earlier about uh, the practice of preparing the, the dead, the preparing the body, and uh, the fact that family member, unless uh, they're in a pinch and they have to, family members uh, never do that. It's always neighbors or, or at least distant, more distant relatives uh, that, that do that, usually of, uh, almost always of the same sex of the, of the uh, deceased person. And that's usually done right away after death. Uh, one of the customs that you find uh, in, mentioned in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of these memoirs and things talking about the, the old days in the Ozarks is this custom of covering up mirrors in a house uh, with a white cloth or a white towel or something like that. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing that you read that and you think, well, somebody's probably still doing that. You know, it's just some of these, 
make sense that, that they probably survived in, in some way. And I can imagine somebody doing that. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, having the quick burials, but sometimes waiting for uh, weeks or months or maybe even until the next year to actually have the funeral. Uh, more of kind of like a memorial service, we would, uh, we would call it now. Uh, it's some of these other uh, folk traditions, folk uh, customs, a rainy funeral means the soul is at rest. I've been to a couple of rainy funerals, and, uh, uh, but I, I guess, you know, it's just kind of a, kind of fitting, you know, it's almost fitting weather for a funeral, rainy, dreary day, and, uh, you know, sort of fits that. Uh, never leave the cemetery until the grave is covered. We pretty much all, uh, you know, uh, uh, disobey that one nowadays. Uh, they... I mean, that, it's, it's pretty much the other way around. Now you always leave the cemetery. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, considered a bad thing if you, if you hang around until they start covering the grave nowadays. You know, you don't want to see that. But back in those days, you waited until the grave was covered, when it was still done by hand. And it was probably, you know, family members or, or close neighbors who were actually doing the shoveling and, and covering it up. You waited until... It was covered up, and, and that's when you left. And so it was considered a bad thing. It's, just, it's interesting how things change over, over time. And now uh, with, the, uh, with the funeral home industry, you know, the undertaker industry that has kind of has its own traditions and its own way of doing things, uh, these funeral traditions, burial traditions, have been kind of homogenized, and they're all done. You know, the, the wake... Maybe a little different. The, fun the, the the way you conduct the funeral may be a little different, but the burial, uh, I'm guessing, is is pretty common uh, for most people nowadays, and it's usually dictated by, you know, the people who are in charge of the body and uh, the funeral home people. And the last thing on here, has anybody ever heard of a feather crown? The significance of a of a so-called feather crown. You might know what a feather crown is. This is, what's that? A crown head of feathers? Yeah, well, it, it, that's basically what it is. Uh, it's, it was a, uh, a folk belief that if a, if a person died, like, you know, usually uh, we're talking about in the days before people tended to die in hospitals. You know, you, you were usually sick at home and you died maybe in your own bed or, or in, you know, in your house. The idea was that after someone dies, you look inside the pillow that, they've, uh, that, that their head was on, and if you find a, uh, like a, this is in the days of feather pillows, we don't use, most of us don't use feather pillows anymore either, but if you look inside the, the pillow and there's, uh, the feathers have kind of formed themselves into what looks like a crown, uh, that's a sign that the person's soul went directly to heaven and that, you know, everything's okay. And there were many people who, that's one of the first things they would do when someone died is kind of tear open the, the pillow and see if they and try to find something that looked like a, a crown in the feathers. And people would even save these and uh, would uh, sometimes, you know, display them for people who visited. This was such the crown from such and such as pillow and stuff like that. And I think uh, there's a, yeah, there's, let me read you just a little section here of, of Randolph where he talks about that. Let's see. Um, when the bereaved family finds one of these feather crowns in the pillow of a relative who has just died, they are quite set up about it, sure that the dear departed has gone straight to heaven and is doing well there, as one old woman told me. The crown is taken out of the pillow with great care and displayed to all the neighbors. Sometimes there is a mention of it in the village paper as a sort of postscript appended to the obituary. Some families keep such a crown in a box for many years, and I have soon seen two crowns sealed up in a glass-topped case of polished walnut, which had been made especially for them. So this was uh, an important uh, custom for, for many people in, in the rural Ozarks, uh, people that, uh, that Vance Randolph came into contact with. 
Uh, just a couple more things in these uh, little traditional, just things that I thought was, was kind of neat uh, that you may never have heard of. Has anybody ever heard of a mad stone? You know what a mad stone is? We don't worry much about uh, rabies anymore, do we? Don't, we don't know many people who get rabies, but once upon a time, rabies was a big, you know, hydrophobia, that was a big scare. Uh, even when I was a kid, I can still remember, uh, you know, the, the older folks always being kind of paranoid when it came to dogs and having rabies and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, a mad stone is a, is a, a, a stone or a little like rock-like substance that uh, tradition had it could uh, cure someone of rabies back in the days when it was more common to, to get rabies. It says, uh, the Madstone treatment for rabies was once popular in many parts of the United States and is still well known in the Ozarks. And this is in the 50s or 60s when he's writing. The Madstones I have seen are porous and resemble some sort of volcanic ash, but the natives all claim that they were taken from the entrails of deer. A true madstone was something that, uh, that you found when you gutted a deer. You know, usually be kind of white, uh, a, a white rock, sort of, you know, like, like he says, kind of volcanic looking rock. These stones are rare now and they are handed down from father to son and are never sold. No charge is made for using the stone, although the patient may make the owner a present if he likes. I have never seen the madstone in actual use, but they tell me that if the dog was really mad... The stone sticks fast to the wound and draws the poison out. After a while, the stone falls off and is placed in a vessel of warm milk, which immediately turns green. The stone is then applied to the wound again and so on until it no longer imparts a green color to the fresh milk. Virtually every old-time hillman believes that if the mad stone is applied soon enough and sticks properly, the patient will never suffer from rabies, even if the dog was mad. So that was... Again, that's something that you'll occasionally come across if you read some of these memoirs that we were talking about of, uh, of old-time Ozarkers. And a lot of people really believed in these mad stones. And uh, I've never seen a mad stone, but apparently they're... I mean, you see them referenced enough that apparently people had them, and I don't know if they actually did anything or not, but, uh, but many people believed in mad stones. And the last thing... Does anybody know what a doodle bug is? You know what? A doodle bug. Yeah, you got the right one. Yeah. Upside down volcano. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like a little cone shape, you know, indention in, 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 in uh, soft sand, right. and they move around. A uh, doodle bug, this is, uh, let's see. Let me turn over here and get to the doodle bug part. Uh, he says, There are several peculiar superstitions relating to the larva of the ant lion. That's what a doodle bug actually is. It's an ant lion larva. Yeah. Which lives in little cone shaped pits in the dirt under rock ledges. Or we used to find them like on the, uh, under the eaves of barns and inside the edges of barns and stuff. Anywhere where the dirt was kind of soft and it was shady and, and that kind of stuff. It says, uh, Every boy is told that if he finds one of these nests and cries, Oh, Johnny Doodlebug, come up and I'll give you a bushel of corn, the insect will climb out and show itself immediately. And did you, did you have a saying or you just dug them up? You guys were just barbarians. You're just digging them up. Yeah. No, my, my, uh, my great aunt... Uh, when I was a kid, uh, taught me, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do the uh, old Johnny Doodlebug. It was, it was Doodlebug, Doodlebug, come and get your buttermilk. And then you would blow on the, on the little nest. And I think it was just the blowing on the nest that would actually get them to, the, yeah, they, they would start rustling around. And they'd be under the dirt. And you could see them kind of rustling around up there. Uh, and I think you could just go, you know, b blow on any nest. It didn't matter what you said, you know, I. Uh, although they, they might have understood what we were saying, you know, maybe they like buttermilk and they, they knew English. I don't really know. But, uh, uh, but I remember uh, when I was a little kid learning that one and, uh, you know, I tried to teach it to my son. He just thought it was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard in his life. And I don't remember 
being that cynical when I was a, when I was young like that, you know, I sort of believed my my great aunt. But uh, uh, so doodle, the next time you see a, a doodle bug hole, you know, just uh, you can either do oh Johnny doodle bug come up and I'll give you a bushel of corn, or you can do the my preferred the buttermilk one, which I think is, uh, you know, that's that may be the Arkansas version since I grew up in Arkansas. The corn may be the Missouri type, but uh, again, all of these. Uh, there are all these different kinds of uh, folk customs and, and traditions. Some of them uh, we get uh, passed down. Most of us today in the 21st century, uh, most of these have gone by the wayside. You know, they, they just they disappeared. A few of them, you know, like doodle bugs and buttermilk and, and things like that, survive uh, somehow. But, uh, but there, you know, there, there are so many things kind of working against their survival of these folk traditions, whether it's religion or, or education or, you know, just the homogenization of society. Sure, yeah. Yeah, if you're, if you're real serious about it and the reason you're doing it is because you think it's going to work and then it doesn't work, then, you know, why, why do it again? You know, why plant in the dark of the moon when, yeah, that didn't, you know, that didn't turn out all that good and we'll... We'll do something else. So I think one area that you still find this a lot, it probably is in gardening. I think there, there, there's still uh, quite a bit of tradition wrapped up in, in people who garden. And usually people who garden today, that you've learned it from someone older, you know, parents or grandparents. And a lot of these uh, customs get passed down. And we may even know, eh, it probably doesn't, mean anything to plant when the signs and the and the secrets or you know the the chest or whatever but you just kind of do it like I like to put potatoes in the ground on St. Patrick's Day just because my grandparents did and they knew a whole lot more than I did about about gardening and, and farming and they always did that so you know why not why not do it but so I think you know it, it, it survives sometimes but for any number of reasons, we, we lose those customs and traditions. And so it's, it's very valuable, and it's interesting to have uh, records of, these, of all of these old superstitions and teachings and customs that, that have, for the most part, died. You know, somebody was there to, to write them down when there were still lots of people who, who believed these things. And, The, uh, the Buckeye? Buckeye? Yeah, the Buckeye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah have a, a Buckeye in your pocket's good luck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, re- I can remember, and the guy, this was, in, this was a college educated guy, but I remember going to a meeting one day. This is probably 10 years ago or so. And the guy comes in and he, he shows us the Buckeye he's carrying in his pocket. You know, he, he got it, and, and it, was for, it was for good luck. And he was doing it. I don't, I don't think he really believed it, but. It was it's a it was a tradition to carry a buckeye you in your pocket. Take a yeah, that's a part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, you think of you think of some of the superstitions that we have today, and I know I know plenty of people who are still uh, deeply superstitious when it comes to black cats in their pads. Ball players are notorious. Yeah. Right. Baseball players are are very superstitious. You know, whether it's not stepping on the line baseline or just whatever it is you know not washing your socks after you know after you win and you watch them when they're getting ready to bat and they do the rituals right where they right have their thing and whatever you know yeah they have to go through it every oh time. sure they yeah skip schumacher drives me crazy you know those of you who are cardinals fans remember oh he's not with the cardinals anymore but uh you know he did you know it, what almost all of them do but he you know he's always undoing his batting gloves and tightening them and how, how loose can they get after taking a ball you know you know you're still you don't even move and uh, all of a sudden you got to tighten them back up but uh yeah it's and it's all that's what it is it's just all routine and superstition and, and stuff like that but uh, the broken mirror seven years seven years yeah that's one yeah I know it's done yeah 
Yeah, you, yeah, not walking under a ladder. You think about, I mean, there's still, and these are all very, these are the most common superstitions that have, that have survived. That's why we all know them or have, have heard of them. Many of us still follow them. Uh, and, and used to, there were just hundreds, hundreds of, of these things uh, back when the world was smaller and, uh, and, and you seemed to be at the mercy of fate, you know, more than, more than we are now. But, but in general, it's, it's probably just not a good idea to walk under a ladder, you know. That's, I mean, that's probably a part of that's just common sense. That's about why I don't walk under the ladder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, we've probably all got, got our superstitions, yeah. Well, I think of, uh, I, was, I was driving home the other night uh, on, a, on a clear night when I could see the moon, and some of you probably heard of uh, dry moon and wet moon. And the funny thing is, it depends on pretty much how you were taught or your own family, which is which. In, uh, in my family, let's see, is this a, those are batteries. I don't have a, well, I don't have a pen. But in, in my family, this, uh, if you had a moon that was, that was sort of like laying on its back, and uh, that was considered a wet moon. If you had one that was kind of like this, where the water could run out the bottom of it, that was a dry moon. But other families, it's just the opposite. That if the water can actually pour out the bottom of the moon, then it's a wet moon. And if the moon can hold the water, it's a dry moon. So it's just... And what it means is, if you've got a wet moon, then it's going to rain soon, sort of like the, the uh, you know, smoke coming to the ground kind of thing. But, you know, it's just those, uh, those kinds of traditions, customs, and, uh, you know, 50% of the people believe one way and 50% the other is just what you were, what you were taught. And if you're planting on St. Patrick's Day, a big chunk of the world doesn't even know what St. Patrick's Day is. So, you know, are they just messing up every time they plant? Or maybe they just don't grow potatoes? I don't really know how that works exactly.